Morning, how are we doing? I, I'm really offended that the residents didn't stay for the second time. Like, they didn't want to hear it again? I mean, my goodness. Gosh. Uh, man, so glad y'all are here today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us in worship. Uh, next week is Next Gen Sunday, so that's our, what we've, we've normally called Launch Sunday, but uh, really it's, it's, it's all of our Next Gen ministries promoting to their next grade, so that'll be next week, uh, August 14th, and some schools start this week. Uh, some schools start next week. So yeah, we're back into uh, the thick of things. Uh, tax-free weekend, load up for this weekend, right? That's what you're supposed to do is go get all of your school stuff and get ready for, and get ready for the, the new year. But I, I'm excited that, uh, that you all are here today. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So just you might glance down uh, if, if you're going to participate in the Lord's Supper to make sure that, that uh, this little cup is uh, is is under your chair. I've got three of them up here, so they were. I was really prepared this morning. But uh, when I was uh, when I was in college, I I attended Wayland Baptist University out in West Texas, uh, in, in Plainview. And while I was there, I served as the student pastor at a church called First Baptist Church of Earth. There is an Earth, Texas. Okay, so just just kind of just bear with me. Twenty miles to the west of Earth was a town called Muleshoe, another Texas town. That's where, my, that's where my wife and that's where her family is from. They had shirts made because um, they were bored, I guess. I don't know. No offense. It's just West Texas. Uh, they said, we live 20 miles from Earth because that's, you know, that was the joke. <laughs> but my brother and I, we, we attended the same school. He, he was also at Wayland Baptist. He played baseball there. And so he had a game one night during the spring uh, on a Wednesday night. And so uh, I led I led Bible study, did the youth group thing, and then I was going to try to make it back. I wanted to go back to see uh, my brother's game and and catch probably the tail end. I knew it'd be towards the end of the game, and so I show I, I got done doing doing Bible study, and I, I showed up around the fifth inning. And Wayland was on defense at this point, and so there was runners on first and third. If you're not a baseball person, just bear with me. All right, there's going to be another baseball reference and another West Texas reference. Okay, so. Just going to apologize in advance, all right? But there's runners on first and third. Wayland was down by a run or two, something like that. And I showed up. I had been there for probably about 10 minutes following our Wednesday night Bible study with our students. And the ball gets hit, and the ball is hit in play. It goes up the middle, and it hits the umpire who's standing behind the pitcher's mound. He's in the position he's supposed to be in. And it hits the umpire. Now, I mentioned there's runners on first and third. There's one out. I thought from my vantage point, because I know better, that the umpire should have gotten out of the way. Because I thought the shortstop would have grabbed it. He could have touched second, thrown it over to first base, double play. Hey, inning, inning, double play. Hey, we're on to next. We can, we can come back here. We can, we can, we can do something here. But the umpire did not get out of the way. And so I, because I know better, yelled out from where I had been standing for the last 10 minutes, hey, show some athleticism one time. The home plate umpire took off his mask and turned around and said, who said that? I owned it. I said, I did. He goes, you're gone. And I was completely ejected from the game that I had been that I had been at for ten minutes, and it was really like it started as like this badge of honor, like like oh yeah I got ejected, and I was like man I am an idiot, <laughs> you know like shame. I thought I knew better. Like if you're in the sports world, right, where your kids play or you played sports, right, we have a problem with with umpires and referees and rules. That's why they play three blind mice when the when the uh, the uh, the umpires come onto the Major League Baseball field, right? We don't like umpires. We don't like rules. We don't like authority. Because we think we can just do it better ourselves. The reality is we need those laws. We need those boundaries. Because if we, if we don't have laws, or in this, case, in this case today, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the law. If we don't have the law, where do we go for, for what's right and wrong? 
Like, how, how, do I, how do I know how to live my life? How do I know how to actually, how actually live in a way that's actually honorable? Because in that scenario, what happens then is that I become my own God. So what we're going to answer today is what is the purpose of the law? Because really what we're going to see for the law shows us how lost we really are. And that's a really, really good thing. Law is helpful. And so Paul addresses three things in this passage regarding law. And so you've, you've heard every week in this series in Galatians that you are justified by faith. You're in a right relationship with God by trusting Jesus and not earning it. And that you're saved by grace and that you have a place in God's family. And so you're going to continue to hear these today as we unpack this passage. So again, we're in Galatians 3. We're continuing on with Paul's argument from last week. So we're going to be in 15 through 29, but I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to check out verses 10 and 11, and then we'll jump into the main passage. But Galatians 3, 1, let's start. Let's start there. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, we, we talked about this last week, right? The, the picture of the gospel, it's on display. You saw Jesus crucified. Some of these Galatians, right, they had been bewitched into thinking that you start, you start the Christian life by faith, but you complete it by good works, they completely ignore the work of the Spirit and the faith that brought them to this point. We are justified by faith. We don't continue to strive to earn God's favor and his love. And then he picks up in 10 and 11, he says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. And do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. So Paul continues. It's turned into it's turned into legalism at this point. It's not based on it's not based on faith. You're under a curse if you if you rely on the law. You're you're not justified. The righteous shall live by faith. This is this is us, right? We believe at first. But then we go on and we continue to do things because I want to earn some sort of blessing from God. And we've bought into the lie. We've been bewitched. And so what Paul's doing, he's just going, okay, stop. Okay, don't, don't do that anymore. Okay, we're not going to do this. Okay, we live by faith. And Jesus came to free us of believing that we can continue to earn God's love. So again, repeat last week just to help set us up for what we're going to look at today. I mean, I, I could preach three sermons out of these 15 verses today. Okay, but there, there's, there's, so, there's so much here. But what I want you to see, I, just, I, I want you to see, I want you to appreciate God for who he is today. That's what I want you to get out of here. So let's pick this up in verse 15. The first, the first thing we find in this passage is we find the promise of God we find the promise of God. Verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, even with the man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Paul's having to demolish the, the argument made by the Judaizers that, that works are what counted Abraham as, as worthy. Paul's digging deep 
end of the history of, of Israel. They're, they're both kind of going back and forth and they're looking at Genesis 12 and they're looking at, at Genesis 15 and they're looking at the Abrahamic covenant. There's this promise. This is an unconditional covenant. Only one of the two parties actually has to do something. And so it foreshadows the forgiveness of sin, Jesus dying on the cross. And so in essence, the nations are now blessed through Israel. And Abraham did nothing except believe. This is what Paul explains in Romans 4, 19 through 22. He, he finishes by saying, faith was counted to him as righteousness. He's justified. And so Paul's given this, this analogy of this, of this contract. And we're, we're, aware, we're aware of contracts. We know that they're legally binding. I'm, I'm curious, is anybody familiar, second baseball reference, anybody familiar with Bobby Bonilla Day? Anybody know what Bobby Bonilla Day is, right? July 1st of every year since 2011, Bobby Bonilla, who played baseball in the early 2000s, mind you, he has not played since then, he played for the Mets, he played for the Orioles, he won a World Series for the Marlins in 1997. Every year since, 20, uh, since 2011, he receives $1.2 million for having played baseball like 15 years ago. It's a deferred money contract. I need an attorney to like walk me through all of the details Right, I just I'm, I was like getting in the weeds this week of going like, okay, back this this is great, okay, this I love it. I'm like, how do you how do you do that, Mets? What are you doing? Through 2035, this guy gets 1.2 million dollars. It's a legal contract; it can't be annulled; it can't be voided. And of course, we kind of sit here, we watch, we read about contracts, they get changed, whatever, whatever else. But right, there were Roman and Greek laws back then that seems like you, did, you couldn't change anything. And what Paul's saying, he says, the law given to Moses does not change the contract. If we're telling people that they must earn their salvation by works, then that covenant with Abraham would be annulled. If God began adding stipulations so that people could supplement their faith with their own effort, then the, can, the, the promise to Abraham is completely void. Look at verse 17. The law which came after does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The promised inheritance, salvation, the Holy Spirit comes only by faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We submit to his promise. We submit to his promise. We believe. We stop striving. We start believing. We, we've got to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. We've got to stop trying to justify ourselves. I, I, I said this a few weeks ago, but busyness, busyness can be a barrier to your relationship with Jesus. You gotta stop trying to earn what is already yours and believe that Jesus alone rescues us from trying to keep the entire law. The law reveals the promise and that promise is ours. And so Paul sets all this up. He's breaking down why the law was given. He's reminding us of the promise of God but then it does kind of beg the question, back to our original question, is okay, well, why the law then? Why, why the Old Testament? Why, 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 why the Ten Commandments? Why do I, why do I gotta go read Deuteronomy? Like, are you serious? That's how he, that's how he starts verse 19. Read with me. Why, why, then, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. 
Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith, uh, this promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So what we find here is we find the purpose of God. We find the purpose of God. And I, I think tone is, uh, is of some importance here. Because I think what happens is that when we read verse 19, we read it like this, okay? Why in the world do we have the law then? You gotta remember, Paul's talking to a bunch of Judaizers. He's using their argument. He knows the law better than they do because they've added to a bunch of things. Yes, yes, faith, faith in Jesus, but then you gotta do all these other things. And what he's doing, he's arguing from their side going like, hey, I, I see what you're saying here. I see, I, I understand. You bring up a really good point. Let me show you. And I think he says it more like this. Why then the law? Because of this. And so the law serves two, uh, two roles. It's got a negative role and it's got a positive role. The negative role is it levels the playing field. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law is like this magnifying glass on, 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 on Israel's sin. The law is given so that Israel would know when they did something wrong. Serves the same purpose for us. The positive role is that I'll talk about more of this in, in, I'll talk more about this in verse 23, but it acts like a, a guardian. It has this custodial function. It's holding us in check until the coming of Christ. Again, West Texas, if you've driven out to Amarillo, Lubbock, the Panhandle, you've, 95% of you have gone to Colorado this summer, okay, like, like when you're driving out that way, okay, there's a lot of starting and there's a lot of stopping. There's a lot of speeding up and there's a lot of slowing down. That's why we have interstates. Because when you drive through these back roads, right, you get to these small towns and you're going along and you're doing 75 and you're like, man, I'm cruising. We got another town? We got an earth? I'm, goodness, where is this? Or it, Pastor Jeff and I were talking about chili coffee. Anybody, anybody in chili coffee? Anybody know what that is? Out on 287 going to Amarillo? Get some, stop at the candy store? Yeah, there's a candy store out there. That was my daughter saying <laughs> We'll go out there sometime. <laughs> On my way to Earth, though, there's a town 14 miles west of Plainview called Halfway. Again, I, I'm, I'm just trying to do my best here, okay? I, I didn't name these, all right? But it, it indicated that I was halfway to the next town, which was Olton, which, which is 28 miles west of Plainview. But I wouldn't know... I wouldn't know I was speeding. I wouldn't know I was going too fast if it wasn't for that blinking yellow light, the only thing they had in the town, and that speed limit sign, right? I wouldn't know I, was, I needed to actually slow down. I wouldn't know I was, oh, breaking the law. Hey, I need, to, I need to slow down here. Or when the state trooper would pull me over many times, okay? But the law is revealing the fact that we cannot keep our side of the agreement. I drove to earth two to three times a week. I knew the law. I wasn't going to uphold that my side. I wasn't going to do it. That's why Paul says there's no need for a mediator in verse 20. Verse 20. Right, a mediator, right? he's working, uh, he he's works between two parties to aid in communication. But again, you go back to the Abrahamic covenant. God did so directly. The promises were given and would be kept by God regardless of the actions of the people. Our sin prevents us from upholding our side of the bargain and God knew that. The issue is that we, we want the security of being able to, to just earn our, our salvation. That's why we add all these human traditions, these standards and these, and these rules to our faith. 
That's all legalism is. We slip back into performing a certain way or serving or I'm gonna do a bunch of good works as if we need to impress God or earn his approval. This is my biggest struggle. I've struggled with this my whole life. Some of you in here are like, yeah, I grew up very legalistic. I grew up in a, a maybe a legalistic church or legalistic culture. I mean, that's why I love a list for my Bible reading. I love being able to check off in the Bible app, right? Like, I did it. I'm done today. And sometimes in the back of your mind, it's like, well, yeah, God, like, you, 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 we're cool, right? I'm reading Bible here. I'm doing this because I'm trying to earn some sort of blessing from God. Some of you, it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll go to this Bible study. I'll, I'll give this much money. I, God, I'll serve in kids ministry. God, okay, I'll, I will go stand out in the heat. And if I do that, you're gonna bless me, right? You like what I'm doing, right? And when you fail to meet all those criteria you've set up for yourself, you, you just feel terrible. All it does is oppose grace. It's purely based on looking good on the outside instead of having a transformed heart. Our hearts apart from the Holy Spirit are utterly self-centered. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is, more, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. The law increases sin by stirring up more self-assertion and self-justification. See, it's not the law that's evil. It's our human heart. The law helps us see that you are not the solution to your problems. The fact that we can take something like the law and turn it into like this, this grading scale to try to make us look better shows how corrupt our heart actually is. It reveals the sinful, na uh, sinful inward nature that we're born into. It just shows the deep rebellion of the human heart. And because of our pride, we think we can do it better. And the law shows that we can't. I love what John Stott, the uh, English theologian, said. He, he said it this way. He says, no man has ever appreciated the gospel until the law has first revealed him to himself. It is only against the inky blackness of the night sky that the stars begin to appear. And it's only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel shines forth. So what we do here is we submit to his purpose. We submit to his purpose. His purpose is to come save us. The purpose of the law reveals God's character, his holiness, his, his standard for perfection, and at the same time, our inability, our hopelessness, and our need for him. Verse 22 shows us that we're imprisoned by sin. We are beaten down by past mistakes. And God provides a way of escape, faith in Jesus Christ. When you believe the gospel, that Jesus alone, he's the only one who can rescue you, you are set free from bondage. You are set free from, from legalism, from guilt, from shame, and you are given life. Again, stop, stop striving, start believing. That's why Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, you know who he's talking to there? He's talking to a bunch of worn out Jews. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's talking to a bunch of worn out Christians who think that they can still complete their life by doing a bunch of good works who are trying to earn approval. He's talking to the worn out person in the room who's just going like, well, I'm, I don't know what I am. I'm just, God, I just want to be blessed. So that's why I'm doing, I'm doing all this. Come to me. Come to me is what Jesus says. So we've seen the promise 
of God. Now we understand the purpose. The purpose of God is to save us. Now I want us to see what it means for the people of God. The people of God. Look at 23 for me in in chapter 3. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under, under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to a promise. That word guardian, again, in, in Greek, pedagogos, in verse 24, is, the, is this idea of, of this, this almost tutor-like person that walked alongside a young boy until they were of age. Their sole responsibility was that kid. That's it. And so this, again, this is more than, than a tutor Right? That's, why, that's why it's translated as, as guardian. This is what the law was doing for Israel. It was pointing them to Christ. This is what it still does today. All scripture points to Jesus Christ. And the law leads, to, leads us to Christ for forgiveness and righteousness. And so those who've been justified, those who've been acquitted of all guilt and forgiveness of all sin are now sons and daughters of God through faith. In verse 26, we're now his adult children. In Roman society, a youth coming, uh, of coming of age, what they would do is they would lay aside this, this robe of childhood and they would actually put on like this, this adult toga. And that represented his move into adult citizenship, uh, adult citizenship with full rights, full responsibilities. Being in Christ leads to our ongoing experience of clothing ourselves with Christ. And so what Paul's doing, he's taking this, this, uh, this, this cultural understanding and he's combining it with baptism. See, these Galatian believers were were becoming spiritually grown up and ready to take on the privileges and responsibilities of the more mature. That's what baptism is. It just shows that you are a new person in Christ. And so I just want to talk about baptism just for just for a second. But but baptism is an is an outward confession of an inward conversion. It's the symbolic washing away of your old self which leads to death, and you're rising again to new life. And what's cool about all that is that we get to actually participate in that. When you're, when you're buried, when you're taken down into the water, you're showing Jesus' death. And when you come out of the water, you are raised in newness of life. See, baptism doesn't make you a Christian. It just shows that you already are one. Again, as Paul has alluded to many times in this letter, especially in chapter three, this is not something we do to just make ourselves look better. He said, that, that's religion. Like if I, if I get baptized, God, you're gonna love me. God, you're gonna bless me, right? No. God, will, God does not love you any differently. You're showing that you have put on Christ by being obedient. And so I, look, I say this with all love. I say this with, with all gentleness, but some of you are holding on to a, uh, to a tradition of the past that's actually preventing you from being obedient in the present. You've been changed. Let us, let us celebrate with you. So I'm, I'm here with others after the service. You can come talk with us. We'd love to have a conversation with you. I mean, I will get you baptized next week if that's what you want. But again, it signifies 
life change. Freedom in Christ is visibly symbolized by our baptism. Like you've heard this, the theme for this whole series is, is freedom. And we've defined freedom as not doing whatever you want to do, it's doing what you ought to do. And so, because we've put on Christ, we are all considered sons of God. We are now united. That's what he's saying in verse 28. He's saying Christians don't have permission to discriminate against other believers. It's not unity for unity's sake. It is unity in Christ. He's like, it's not because you're white. It's not because you're black. It's not because you're a female. It's not because you're a male. It's not because you think I belong to a third party that's better than the other two, that that's what's actually going to get my inheritance. No, he's saying, no, no, no. You all get the same inheritance. None of that other stuff matters. Those barriers have been broken down so that we could be united in Christ. Jesus levels the playing field. And so those who recognize Jesus in their common life, they find deep unity and fellowship. Those in Christ are all getting the same Inheritance. Look at verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what do we do? We submit to each other. It looks like community and it looks like service. I mentioned that word, that word fellowship. You can, you can be a part of a community. You can be in a group. You can be in a, in a class that's all united around one person. It's not, it's not a thing. It's not a trend, right? It's a community that believes in the transformational power of the gospel. So maybe you've been disconnected from friends. Maybe you're, you're just like, man, I, I, need some, I need a group. I need something to, to help strengthen my faith. I need something that helps maybe equip me for, for how, do I, how do I live out my faith in, at, at my work. We have opportunities for you. We're about to, in about a month, we're about to start our, our midweek program, which we're gonna call Grow. Because we want disciples who make disciples so that our personal faith is strengthened, our families are strengthened, our church is more unified, and that we can go out in our city and we can encourage others to join us to go, hey, come, come on, let's follow Jesus together. And so you, our website, there's, there's also this floating around today. If you, if you want to pick up one of these, there's, there's this. It has everything in here from, from crew for our students during the week if you're looking for something to strengthen your marriage, there's Marriage Core. If you're looking for something that maybe, because I, I need to be equipped, I want to strengthen my, my, uh, my apologetic, you can do that. Pastor Jeff's going to be leading a class on, uh, on that. But you can also go to our website. It's got, everything, it's got everything on there. It's opportunities just for you to explore. It's not about joining some, some program, right? It's strengthening your walk with Jesus. And then I mentioned the other thing. The other thing is serving. You can serve. Ultimately, like we're, we're deeply committed to each other. And so what that means is we actually serve each other. And that means we serve in the next generation because the next generation coming behind us, that's who we want to raise up to lead the church in the future. And so it's not just me being the next-gen guy going like, okay, not like the next-gen guy, guess what? He needs people to serve. Yeah, I do. But it's not because I just, I just need you to serve. I want you to serve. I want you to use your talents, your gifts, your resources, all to impact not just the next generation, but all generations, and to lead all generations to love Jesus but yes, especially in next gen, okay? So, <laughs> but we've got opportunities. You can serve in kids ministry. You can lead Bible studies during the week for our crew homes, for our students. You can lead one of these groups during the week. You can start a group maybe here on Sunday morning. 
Again, we'd love to talk to you about any of those things right after our service. But that's what it means to be the people of God. So why the law? It reminds of God's promise. It reveals God's purpose and it's for his people. And so because of the law, we, 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 we submit to God's promise. We submit to his purpose and then we submit to each other. We enter covenant relationships with one another because we are committed to each other. The law, just, the law just points us to something better, and because of that, we're free to celebrate. We're just, we can remember that Jesus is better. I'm not better. Jesus is better. 